Good evening, everyone. Welcome to your weekly tour around your celestial neighborhood. I'm Irene Pease, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, and this week I am super excited to be talking about celestial highlights of 2021. Grab your calendars. If you don't have your calendars handy, go grab them. Um, we are going to be using a lot of different visuals tonight. As you can see, we have Stellarium and Open Space as usual. That's Open Space in the background right now. Um, but we're also going to be using Solar Walk, Sky Safari, and another extra special JPL small body database browser if I can find it in all the windows on my screen. All these extra fun things because I'm not by myself tonight. I'm really excited <laughs> to uh, to be doing this with my friend and astronomy colleague um, Ted William. So I'm just going to bring Ted on. I know you don't most never see what I look like. So here's me. Hi Ted. <laughs> Welcome to Hi, the Irene. Astronomer Weekly live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Does everybody know we've been doing this show for a couple of years already at Hayden? This is our normal December show. Yeah. So since Hayden's closed down, I was like, all right, so Ted and I are normally doing like celestial highlights for the next year and the seasonal skies. We're going to cut out the seasonal skies and just do celestial highlights that we, like last year, we told everyone about all the cool things that were happening in 2020. We left out all the crap that we didn't know was going to happen, but all the astronomy stuff that, that <laughs> happened, that went well. Um, so right. yeah, since we're not able to be there, uh, I thought, hey, why not just do it here. So I'm so glad so you could join great. me for this, Ted. This is, this is very just, refreshing. I just wanted to say to you, I just wanted to say to you, I miss it. Man, do I miss being up there. <laughs> you know, I've complained to you so many times about the commute in and out, but it's worth it when you get the feedback from the audience. So yeah. I hope the folks out there are, are just as thrilled. But it's cool to be with you, Irene. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to put some links in the chat. Um, Ted Harkins from the Philadelphia area. Um, Rittenhouse Astronomical Society and you observe at Muddy Run Observatory. So you might tell us a little bit about that as you go, some of your experiences as they relate to some of the things that we're going to be showing. Um, but yeah, to kick it off, I'm just going to hand this on off to Ted to talk about some of the first super duper events that you should be looking out for this next year. So we were thinking about the whole year in advance and we kind of broke it down into a couple categories. And we were thinking about things that you guys could see from the city skies too. Um, conjunctions you're all aware of because Irene did a whole lot of work with you last year and, and so did I with our groups we were following that uh, Jupiter and Saturn conjunction we'll do a little bit on meteor showers tonight we'll do a little bit on lunar eclipses and solar eclipses uh, these are the major events that you tend to see coming up through the year so that conjunction it was funny because on the same night that Irene was going to go live I knew she was because we were doing this from Muddy Run Observatory and what we, everyone was trying to do was ca capture uh, Jupiter and Saturn coming close together in the nighttime sky. I'm going to switch over to a piece of software that's going to do a little bit of a simulation for you. It's called Solar Walk. And keep in mind that what you're seeing, nothing is to scale. Uh, the planets are all drawn amazingly large. That's just so that we can see what's going on. There's that Earth. And it's funny because I was thinking of the Hayden when I did this because um, we usually start with the software this way. I'm going to zoom out a little bit right now, and I'm going to put the Earth right between uh, us and the sun. What you want to do is pretend you're on the daytime side right now. Um, one of the illusions we see all through the day is it looks like the sun crosses our sky. It's really the Earth rotating. If I make the sun look like it crosses the far side, the sky, well, uh, right here would be about sunrise. And right before sunrise, if you're out in the morning sky, there's Venus up there. It's not going to look like that. It's going to look like a bright star. The software makes you see the planet's surface without clouds. But Venus is like a morning object. The conjunction, and that's what I have this set up for. This is actually set up for uh, the 21st of last year. And um, we were all outside trying to capture this grand illusion. And the reason I call it a grand illusion is because the software even makes it worse. The uh, Jupiter and Saturn look like they're on top of each other out there in the distance. Now, to give you an idea of what's really happening, let's back out over top of everything. Jupiter and Saturn are no closer than they normally are to the sun. Granted, they are closer to each other because they're both on the same side of the sun in their orbit. But the illusion that we see in the sky is they look like they're coming together and they're touching. Mm, it's not truthful at all because they're actually so distant. It's all an alignment of sight. So when this happened last year, um, the two aligned uh, and the optimum alignment time was uh, the 21st of December. What I think everyone missed, though, was we started talking about this conjunction a good year beforehand. 
It was actually the previous summer when we saw Jupiter and Saturn almost uh, 20 degrees apart. We had a great celebration at Muddy Run Park. We had a Sky and Star Festival, and we actually had a fireworks show, and we put it off between Jupiter and Saturn. So from that point on, people were encouraged to look at Jupiter and Saturn when they appeared in the sky this year. And the fun of this was following it all the way through the time it happened. If you just went out the very night and looked at the very moment that was supposed to be the best, you actually miss all that planetary motion. And one of the neatest things in our solar system is to catch things in motion. What I thought was really the coolest was the week before and a couple of nights after the conjunction, because if you were to take your hand and put it up there in the sky, elbow straight out, you could put a pinky between the two and you could actually watch the distance change. You could see it night by night. And to me, that's, that's pretty exciting. So I'm not going to let that thing drop for a second because that conjunction is going to drop out of our sight for us. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play around with the date right here, and I'm going to take us forward in time. So this is the 21st, and we'll go to the 22nd, the 23rd. We'll actually finish out the year. Remember, Earth is going around the sun, so it's going to make it look like the sun is kind of passing between us and Jupiter and Saturn. So what's going to happen is we've lost sight of Jupiter and Saturn because they're on the far side of the sun right now, and this is in January. So when they come back around on the other side of the sun, uh, they're actually going to be visible in the morning morning sky. And Irene and I were talking about this. The, the best time we actually thought that would be good to check this out, got to wait about a month or two and see if you can get yourself all the way into, oh, hold on a second. I kind of lost the date, went backwards. Let me go forward. Forwards in Here time. No yep. more 2020. We want 2021, Ted. We're done yeah, with 2020. I know. Keep, so done with it. Keep going. <laughs> keep going forward. <laughs> well, let me go forward here to, let's say about March. And I'm looking at, let's say about March 6th. So there's February, and when we get to March, take a look. Jupiter and Saturn are now on the uh, right side of the sun. That means they're going to be, uh, we could say they're on the west side of the sun, and we're going to be seeing them early in the morning right there. So this is 219, 220. Let's go all the way ahead uh, to the very beginning of March, because that would probably be when they're high enough off the horizon to be able to see them. And what I thought we could do is take a look over there, because, oh, well, look. Now we have Jupiter and Saturn. They're a lot further apart than they were during the conjunction, so we could call this a gathering. But now Mercury is in the field of view. Um, Mercury is actually at its greatest elongation. Now, now I'm throwing a second term at everybody. So a conjunction is a gathering of the planets. The elongation that I'm referring to is Mercury has reached its furthest part uh, away from the sun that it is. And this is going to be on the western side of the sun, so it's a morning event. And here's a neat camera-ready uh, thing, too, because look at that. We have the moon coming right around there in our view. So not only will we have Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn all visible in the sky on that morning, we'll have a beautiful crescent moon happening there also. So that's a neat one to look for. And you know, if you guys are early morning risers and you get up in the morning, uh, take a look over at those planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and watch them from March, April, and May. You'll see them again getting further and further away from them in the sky. Uh, once they get uh, two fists, maybe about 20 degrees apart, then the motion doesn't become as apparent. But here's a special one I found, everybody. What I did is I switched over into Sky Safari. We have another conjunction that I wanted to point out to you guys, and it's going to be, I set this up for July 13th. And if you're not really an early morning riser, this might be the time for you evening stargazers to get out. It's going to happen just at about sunset, uh, even just before sunset, because Mars and Venus are going to come close together, much closer than even uh, Jupiter and Saturn did. You know, it was disappointing to hear many people refer to the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction as the Christmas star. Um, Irene would agree with me. There's no real scientific data to support that. And there was a conjunction back at that time, and it was really between um, Venus and Jupiter, two brightest objects. Um, and again, not enough scientific theory or not enough scientific proof, but there was a triple conjunction back there at that time, uh, around the time of the birth of Christ. I'm hoping nobody calls this a Christmas star again. <laughs> you, what you're going to see is a small, a bright object, Venus, and it's going to look bright next to Mars. It's, and, but Ted, it's uh, Christmas for, in July. Everyone needs Christmas in July. 
Okay, yeah, okay. So we'll have that's right. They do have that holiday. It's usually the middle of yeah, it's getting close. It's the middle of July or so, exactly halfway. Okay. Well anyhow. Um Venus and Mars will do the conjunction also. And if I were to take my glasses off and look up in the sky, yeah, they would look like one star. But um, and Irene came up with the idea, too, because she was saying, what do you think? Is it better with binoculars or a telescope? And I was thinking, well, the telescope would actually just split the view uh, because it's going to show you. The, they're pretty close together, though. They're less than one degree apart. In fact, the software can actually measure it for us. So let's give it a try. We'll measure them at the conjunction. Uh, 32 uh, arc seconds. So you're not that far apart. It's going to look very, very close together there. So that's um, about the separation. That's like the, the diameter of a full moon in our sky about half a degree yeah so yeah so that's, that's less close. than half a degree if it fits in the moon, it's close. Close. <laughs> yeah so so for some of you it might look like they did come together in the sky but here's the reason you might want to get your uh, binoculars out for this one also because well uh, there's some neat sights to see around there also. There's a star cluster down below, the precipice star cluster, and also the moon's also a great target to use in your binoculars too. Now, I was talking about those elongations, and remember I said that Mercury was at greatest elongation? Uh, here's something you want to put a couple dates down. Uh, Irene said to have your calendars ready. I'm not going to do a whole year. I'm going to just get you ready for the beginning of this year, though, because March 6th, that's that conjunction I talked about, and that's when Mercury will be the furthest uh, it is from the sun that we'll be able to see it. That's your best chance of seeing it. Uh, Venus will be at eastern elongation on March 20th, and that will make it a nice evening star. By May 17th, Mercury will go to the other side of the sun. It'll be on the eastern side, so you'll see it in the evening. But here's my bet, everybody. If you were to look at the, um, let's say, the best elongation, and they're the best way to see the inner planets, uh, the best one of the year is going to be October 19th, and that's when Venus will be its furthest east from the sun. Now, that means you've got a whole month beforehand to look at that, and a good month after that to look at it, because um, that's, that's really when it's going to be at its uh, highest. But it's going to be so easy. You'll just have to pick out the brightest thing in the sky, and I think you'll find it very easily at that time. So a couple of neat conjunctions to look out for, a couple of elongations. And all we're trying to do is share with you how you look at the planets. How are they gathering, or when are they furthest from the sun to look at? If you're a Jupiter and Saturn fan, they reach opposition. That's when they're opposite from the sun, uh, Saturn on August 2 and Jupiter on August 19th. Don't just look on the 2nd and the 19th. Look at all the days in between. Look a week before and after. And Irene, isn't there something special happening on all the days in between on the August 2nd and uh, August 19th? I don't know. I think there might be an August thing happening. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop us over to Stellarium. So this is the software that I like using. I use it in the field. I use it almost every single day <laughs> for various things, just checking stuff out. Um, so, yeah, so this is our view from the beautiful mountains of Brooklyn and this is set for early August I think you can see down there it's set for August 1st 2021 so some of the planets Venus as Ted was talking about and really what we want to do is wait for it to get dark 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 so again the sun is setting pretty late this is 8 30 I remember when you know it used to not be dark when I started the live stream at eight o'clock <laughs> so we're going to go late into the night we see all these kind of aqua things popping up so those are the meteor showers and Ted and I picked out two top meteor showers that you should be marking on your calendars and making plans to see first the Perseids all right so usually people think meteor showers are like yeah Perseids Perseids are great, okay? They're, some years they're better, sometimes they're not as great. This is going to be a pretty good year for the Perseids. Here we see the moon there, um, a pretty, pretty late moon, 24 days old almost, but that's on August 2nd as we are now, right? So we want to be closer to uh, kind of August 9th to 13th, really through all of late July and the first half of August. You can see Perseids in the night sky. But the best nights to see them are the night, the ninth through the 13th of August. So I'm just going to kind of head through there. And really, they peak the night of like August 11th and 12th. So since the Perseids are, they have their radiant point in the constellation Perseus. That's why we call them the Perseids. So if you can imagine like a guy with the Gorgon head. I know we talked about algal and oh, there goes one now. Um, <laughs> we talked about that um, a few weeks back. 
Um, but yeah, so this radiant point, that's the point from which they appear to originate. So they might be all over the sky. So even if you don't know how to find the constellation Perseus, that's okay. I'll probably walk you through it. I will every year. But in the meantime, just know you want to go out to somewhere uh, dark, uh, somewhere where you can look up and see a lot of sky. Bring a blanket, lie back, bring binoculars. You don't need a telescope. The last meteor shower that I went to view, I brought my binoculars, but I wound up not even using them. Um, thanks, Faisal, for driving me out to the freezing, freezing cold for that. So <laughs> uh, for the Perseids, I just wanted to share a little bit of like what's really happening um, in space to make these meteor showers happen. And because we have all this fabulous data in open space, we're actually going to pop over there and see this. Uh, in open space. Uh, so right now we're looking at, so open space, again, this is all real data and this is, uh, this is open source software that you can download and run, like fly around the universe in 3D, super fun. So I have this date set for August 12th, like right around the peak of the Perseids. So you can see this yellow line, that is the, uh, that's the orbit of, <laughs> of the comet Swift-Tuttle. And it's the debris from that comet that generates all the stuff that hits our atmosphere and goes streaking across the sky and, you know, just lights up really pretty, all the pretty things. But as we kind of zoom in here, and I'll turn on a little bit of time so we can actually watch the Earth, the moon going around, actually plow through this. So too many seconds per minute. Um, yeah, let me just adjust a few hours, too many hours, just a couple hours. And we can see the earth, whoosh, go right through it. So I imagine it like like kind of a waterfall, all right? So there's these particles streaming down here and smashing into what would be basically the kind of the top of the earth. I don't know, there's no up in space, but we'll say the northern hemisphere. So those are going to be happening. Those are going to be peaking kind of late uh, late, late night, early morning, because it's coming from that angle. There's another meteor shower that I also want to point out. And I have somewhere, if I can find it <laughs> in all the windows, um, I have a kind of a visual for this other um, meteor, or sorry, this other comet. So again, with, with Swift-Tuttle, it's coming at this kind of glancing angle, almost perpendicular. Um, the other one is gonna be kind of coming from behind the Earth's and like catching up to it in its orbit. So for that, I'm gonna see if I can pop over, see if I can move stuff out of the way, pop over to um, the JPL, uh, what did I call it? Yeah. So this is our uh, JPL small body database browser. So I'll put the link in there. You can find this and explore on your own. Super fun. So this is Comet 21P. I'm not going to, yeah, something's in her. And uh, so that's like the orbit in 3D that we can see. Um, so we can see it's only inclined a little bit, like 30 degrees, but again, it's coming down at kind of this glancing angle and catching up to the earth. Well, that side of the earth, that's the side of the earth. It's just turning away from the sun. So that means these are kind of smashing into the earth, uh, really close to sunset, right? So in the early, early evening. So if we go back over to see if I can find my Stellarium, found it, um, so in Stellarium, <laughs> we can fast forward. This is going to be the Draconids, right? So that's just going to be just a couple of months later into uh, October. So literally like two months later, I can turn off some of these fun things. And if we go back to like around sunset time and see the sun, oh, there goes the sun, all those planets. Um, we want to look kind of around October 6th to 10th is a good time to catch the Draconids. And really the peak night is gonna be October 8th. So if we look, here's the moon on the 11th, go back, go back, go back. Again, there's a good moon phase. So as soon as the sun has set, the moon is basically setting also, so we don't have the glare of the moon. So that's why Ted and I wanted to highlight these two, the Perseids in uh, early to mid August, and then the Draconids two months later in October. So again, the Draconids, the radiant is out there in the kind of western sky after sunset. 
And because it's at this kind of glancing angle, they tend to be much longer streaks. Uh, if you ask Stellarium for all the information, it gives you kind of a range for how many shots per hour you might see, anywhere from 20 to 700. So if we have a few hundred, we'll see like the dragon has awoken or I don't know, something exciting like that. Um, <laughs> and also just a heads up from New York City, the radiant is actually circumpolar. So that means that as we watch it through the night, it, okay, it sets a little bit behind that mountain, but otherwise it doesn't it doesn't really set. So early evening for the people who might be early birds getting up to see all the cool morning stuff that Ted and I have planned for you this year. So if you're if you're not a late night person, if you're not going to make it out for the Perseids, maybe you can stay up for the Draconids because you don't really have to stay up. But still, again, just find a dark spot, big open sky, away from the city lights if you can find it. Um, and that's that's a bunch of stuff hitting the earth. So those are my meteor showers. And Ted has some more stuff for us. So we're just going to pop us back over to Ted. Green's right, though, everybody. Find our, there we are. <laughs> Green's uh, right about what she was saying. What, what you want to do is even if you take your binoculars out for a meteor shower, it'll actually cause you to lose some of the meteors because you might be looking at some of the night sky. You just want to keep your eyes as wide open as you can and, and take in as much of the sky as you can, stay as warm as you can also. So we start to pick out some other things that you folks would hear on the evening news. Uh, the conjunctions come up, meteor showers come up. The other thing that they report on a lot are lunar eclipses. Um, lunar eclipses are actually pretty easy events to see because usually anybody on the dark side of the Earth that uh, is facing the eclipse is going to be able to see it. Uh, a lunar eclipse is when the Earth's shadow is going to fall on the moon. So mentally, you want to think of the lineup as the sun, then the uh, Earth, and then the moon. So the moon's going to pass into the Earth's shadow. And um, you're going to hear a lot about this in the news on May 26th because there's going to be a lunar eclipse then, but it's not a good treat for us on the East Coast. It's actually going to happen on the other side of the Earth. So we won't be able to see that, although it might be picked up in the media. A lot of other countries will. The one that I would like you to cue in on would be this November. Uh, November 19th uh, is going to be a lunar eclipse. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to simulate it for you for a second. Um, lunar eclipses were uh, pretty phenomenal, especially to younger people, because uh, David Rittenhouse, when he saw a lunar eclipse as a child, um, basically started off a whole career in astronomy. He was only about the age of six, and he saw what looked like a, a bloody red shadowy color come across the moon. And when he was told it was the shadow of the Earth and the moon, he was amazed. And he, he set out a way to try to figure out how could he be aware when these would happen again. Uh, David Rittenhouse is the um, not the founder, but the inspiration for our society. And um, a lot of people don't realize he was a polymath. He could think in numbers. And by the age of 16, he was already calculating planet positions and conjunctions and setting up the data for almanacs. So I'd like to share with you an eclipse that's going to happen, a lunar eclipse. And I've got the moon just to the right of the meridian. And that meridian is an imaginary line, divides the sky north and south. And when it hits the meridian, it's usually halfway through. It's reached its highest spot. So the clock down below, if you can't see it, is set for 12 o'clock a.m. Uh, that's erroneous. There's no 12 noon and 12 p.m. It's, it's 12 noon and 12 midnight, but we're going to call it 12 uh, a.m. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to let some time go by with this. We're going to do it very slowly. And I'm going to go in because it's just about here that the uh, lunar eclipse might start. Now, don't go out just at the peak. Uh, try to go out every hour during that night and take a look at something like this. Because let me center that moon there. Keep it centered. Okay, and let's go through a little bit of time. Now, you'll start to notice what looks like a grayish colored shadow coming over the moon's surface. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more on this one. I'm waiting for Facebook to catch up. And what you'll actually see is uh, the lunar surface and you'll see a, a, a gray shadow coming over one side. That shadow is what we call the penumbra. You're not in the darkest part of the Earth's shadow, but you're in a part that's somewhat detectable. A lot of people don't really notice this. It doesn't really stand out that much in the sky to them. But what I'd like to do is take the minutes ahead just a little bit further and step it through, because now we're around 2 o'clock in the morning. 
And what we're going to start to see is, and possibly, because you never know if it's going to be blood red or coppery red or just like a, 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 a rosy pink, now you're starting to see the umbra of our shadow. Um, it might come as a surprise, people. Earth doesn't have a dark shadow. It has a reddish color because the sunlight's actually uh, refracting a bit around through our atmosphere, uh, bending into our shadow, and you're actually seeing some of the effects of our atmosphere. All the blue right is bounced out, giving us the blue sky. The red wavelengths pass right through. So if there's aerosol particles up in the sky, there might be less of this effect. Or there could be more depending on you know the condition of the atmosphere. But as we go through this now, I'm just going to take it through, you'll see the red shadow, that reddish color starts to cover the moon. And what's weird is it's not going to be total, but it's going to be really darn close to total. I think it goes right to about here, just about 4 o'clock in the morning. And we still have a little piece of the, a limb of the moon. This might be a really interesting thing to look at in a telescope. Um, these lines are not as distinct as this software makes it out to be. But if we only see that little tiny crescent of that moon right there, it might make for an interesting night. And here's something else. And Irene saw this when she was saying, again, do you think it's good with binoculars? Well, look right above the moon. There's that beautiful Pleiades star cluster right there. So when the moon gets darker, the Pleiades will start showing you more. When I'm up in New York and I'm doing like talks out on the terrace, we're lucky if we see about four or five stars in the Pleiades. Um, some people, if you're towards the rivers and you're looking away from the pollution of the city, you'll see about six of those stars. But you should check it out this night because you might be able to see some more. Uh, some more might pop into view because that moon is going to be obscured by the shadow of the Earth. And there's another cool cluster just on the other side. There's the Hyades cluster right there. Uh, a big V shape of stars in the sky. I'll give you a little bit of idea of distance. Hyades cluster, about 150 light years out, much closer to us. Pleiades, almost 400 light years out. That light left 400 years ago. A beautiful young cluster. We'll say that those stars are on the order of a 1 to 200 million years young. Um, and open clusters like this, building blocks of our galaxy. But wait a second, that's the lunar eclipse report. Irene, you want to try to top this one and do a little bit of a solar eclipse report? Yes. So I would love <laughs> to talk about that because usually whenever we have a lunar eclipse, we have a solar eclipse within a few weeks of that. So kind of over back here in open space, we can see kind of the alignment. So I've kind of highlighted uh, the orbit of the moon. So I kind of stretched that out. And you can see the orbit of the Earth, like kind of ignore the glare of the sun back there. But you see the orbit in two different planes, all right? So those planes are going to intersect, but the moon isn't always at that point of intersection when it passes, when it forms a syzygy, one of my favorite words, just an alignment <laughs> with the Earth and sun. So this is actually set for just before that eclipse that Ted was talking about. So this would be the November eclipse. And then if I run time so we'll run time let's go you know, through a few days here um yeah a few oh. days and hit that so we can see the moon is going to be lined up exactly sun earth moon and oh just kidding <laughs> don't panic um open space quit unexpectedly so i'm just going to reopen that but basically you have this alignment between the earth the moon and the sun and so those um, like when you have the, the moon on the far side, as Ted was showing us, that's basically going to pass through the shadow of the earth. And then when the moon comes back around, it's still more or less aligned, right? So those, those orbits are still pretty much aligned. And so we'll be able to see, uh, yeah, <laughs> see, this is going to reopen. Uh, so we'll be able to see the, uh, um, <laughs> I'm just going to put it back on us. We'll be able to see the, uh, the moon basically blocking out the sun. So I'm just going to try one more time. Um, I think I, I've taxed open space just a little bit, maybe too much here. We'll try it, give it one more go because it's a pretty cool alignment here. Um, so let me just uh, pull that up. Um, applications, open, says me. Open space. It's a lot of data, folks. That's basically, <laughs> it's a lot of data. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so the, unfortunately the, 
solar eclipse that will occur in December, just a few weeks after the lunar eclipse Ted was showing us, that one isn't really going to be visible from most of the Earth. There will be a shadow, a full shadow of the sun hitting the Earth, but it's mainly going to hit Antarctica. So if you're going to be in Antarctica, kudos, go see it. It should be it should be a blast. Um, it'll be warm down there, right? It'll be getting close to summertime in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but we, uh, <laughs> there comes open space. Uh, but I, I don't know. I'm not, I wasn't going to plan to travel to Antarctica. I was going to try to, but with the, the way this whole year went, that might not happen. Okay. So skip the, skip the solar eclipse for December. Yes, there will be one. I might say something about it at the time, but you know, maybe, maybe not. The, the other one that I wanted to show you though, I'll just go ahead and we got open space back again. I'm going to skip to the other eclipse of 2021 and line us up for that in just one moment. Um, so we could pop back over, welcome back open space. Um, so we still have, so now we're set up with the, you see the moon over there um, about to, to kind of block out the sun, right? So if we just play through time a little bit here, time play a little bit um we'll see it actually kind of drift across the, we'd see the moon slowly drift across the face of the sun oh so slowly okay this isn't very slow zoom there it went all right so what's happening there well i wanted to show the kind of the orbit of the moon um, as it's going around the earth because this is very relevant to a super exciting thing that's happening <laughs> Saturday, Saturday, Ted, it's coming up already. So here we can really? see the orbit of the moon. Uh, let me just stretch that out a smidge. The moon's orbit, a um, little bit longer. And there we go. So the moon doesn't orbit the sun in a perfect circle, right? Sometimes it's a little bit closer. Sometimes it's a little bit further away. So for this solar eclipse, the moon is actually a little bit further away. It's closer to what we call uh, apogee. So perigee is when it's close. Apogee is when it's far away. I'm always terrified I'm going to get those wrong in like a live show. And someday I will, but not tonight. And <laughs> so when it's further away, its shadow doesn't quite make it all the way to the earth because it's a really long way all the way to the earth. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we're going to have an annular uh, eclipse. So this solar eclipse won't be total. Um, and we have a picture. So that would be a total solar eclipse, right? Where you can see the corona, all these flames, super jazzy, super sexy. Annular eclipse, still pretty cool, maybe not quite as sexy. But we because the moon is further away, it's going to look a little bit smaller. It doesn't block out all of the sun like you get with a solar eclipse, right? So full solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, annular solar eclipse. So that's what's going to be happening. That'll be visible from a lot of the northern hemisphere. But I know what you really need to know is what's that going to look like from Brooklyn <laughs> or from the New York City area? Or <laughs> if you're in Ted's neighborhood, what's that going to look like if you're near Philadelphia? So here we are again, set for the beautiful mountains of Brooklyn. And I have this set for the early morning and oh, it looks like the sun is starting to rise. Let's, let's, take, a close, let's take a close gander there as we flip through the minutes. And oh, right, Ted, we never want to look directly at the sun, right? Don't be Got that guy. It. You know who I'm talking about. Don't be that guy <laughs> that looks directly at the sun without a proper filter. Don't do that. So as we as we see the sun rising, there's going to be like a bite taken out of it. It's like a little I don't know Pac-Man om nom nom kind of thing. Don't worry, it'll 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 become full again. But that's going to be the moon just moving off to the side. So again, uh, definitely a year for the early birds. So you'd have to get up pretty early to catch this. It'll be very close to the horizon. Um, from the amazing astrophotographers at the Amateur Astronomers Association, I'm anticipating some fabulous photos taken from New Jersey with maybe like a hint of the iconic New York City skyline. So just saying, guys, all you fabulous astrophotographers out there, I'm not oh, asking, I'm just saying <laughs> that could be a fun so that thing. That morning, I think if you're Chinese, you have the excuse to get out in the street and bang your pots and pans. Bang some pots in and pans. In ancient Chinese culture, they thought that that was a dragon taking a bite out of the sun. 
And that's why they would make all this noise when it was happening to scare the dragon back away. Scare so the if you want to go out that you want to go out that way and be popular with your neighbors <laughs> that morning, get your trash can lids out and start clamoring around. Tell them you're celebrating a uh, a partial uh, an annual eclipse. Right. <laughs> a partial eclipse. <laughs> so so those are <laughs> so those are kind of our 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 fun things that we had for you. Um, I uh, actually before before I run through the credits, I do just want to share one other fun thing that's happening. Let's put this back to uh, open space. Um, I was talking about the orbit of um, of the moon, you know, not being perfectly circular. So you have your calendars all marked up. There's one other thing that I just want everyone to be aware of because it's one of my favorite astronomical annual holidays. It's a holiday, right, Ted? We can call it a holiday. It's a jolly okay. holiday. <laughs> You know where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> Ted knows where I'm Go going with it. this. All right. So there's our glorious star, the sun, right? Um, and we can see the orbits of the planet. So it opens space again. We kind of visualize there's not actually lines out in space, but all the rest of this is real data. Um, okay. And I can bring up a grid, a beautiful ecliptic sphere right so if i center the sun on that sphere then it basically has concentric circles those are going to be actual circles going out around it so i think we're set are we set for now now we are not set for now now let's go to now in open space and i broke it again okay <laughs> oh no <laughs> i don't think i've ever broken open space twice in one day all right so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna say <laughs> we get um <laughs> when we're closer to the sun with that's actually coming up that's going to be this saturday that is our perihelion so uh, <laughs> um let's see if i can get this back up again <laughs> so Ted, I I wanted to be able to wish everyone a merry perihelion, and actually, um, I'm going to bring you back just to celebrate with me because this has just been this has been too much fun. All right, so for perihelion, this is this is how you celebrate perihelion. Can you do this with me, Ted? Will you humor me for two more minutes? All right, go ahead. So put your yeah. hands in the air, and you say, well, "Can't see them." <laughs> they disappear. They and you say, they virtually Wee! disappear." <laughs> okay, Wee! I got to do this. So. <laughs> and I do spirit fingers, so it's like, we because you're going actually just a tiny bit faster. So when we're closer to the sun, we're going faster. When we're further from the sun, we're going slower. So on Perihelion, that's this Saturday, folks. That's the Perihelion 2021. We'll be going just a little bit closer to the sun. And so you can be like, wow, that, this is so fast. Look at the wind in my hair. So, so thank Irene, you so much for joining me, Ted. I appreciate wait, 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 wait. it. <laughs> Before you sign off, yeah. I want to corner you. Can I get you out to be an astronomer with us sometime <laughs> at Muddy Run next summer? I'd you love might to be have able you to do out. that. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to have you do a live show with us out there. Uh, I, mean, I know that the people in our group really <laughs> liked it when you did a talk with us. And that, uh, a couple of them are listening in tonight, too. So um, come on back. Come on out next All summer. Right. Let's hope we, <laughs> we can gather. Okay? I will. I <laughs> would love to take you up on that. I'll get my vaccine. I'll pop right over. <laughs> No, wait, don't we usually run out for pizza now? How do we no. do this? Fight? All right, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw our credits out there. So again, um, all the visuals that we use tonight, uh, Stellarium, Open Space, Solar Walk, Sky Safari, and even um, the JPL Small Body Database. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for just this on a quick preview of your celestial highlights. Again, I'm Irene Pease, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, and we just want to wish you all a safe and happy new year and, of course, a merry perihelion. A merry perihelion. <laughs>